Stanford University. Okay, lecture six of Stanford CS193P, spring of 2021. Today, our primary topic is going to be finishing out our list of varieties of types by talking about protocols. Protocols, very, very important in Swift UI, and also probably the kind of type that's the most different from other languages that you might have seen. We're really going to hop into a demo and build our own reusable container view like an H stack or lazy B grid type thing. And that's going to use protocols quite a bit to make it happen. Then we'll switch gears and talk a little bit about shapes, you know, around rectangle circles, that kind of thing, and even go back into our demo and invent our own kind of shape, the little pie shape that is the countdown timer on the backs of our cards. So protocols. Well, a protocol is sort of a stripped down struct or class. For example, I've got a protocol here, movable. You can see it's got funks and vars, but none of those funks and vars have any implementation. The little curly braces you see after the vars are just saying whether that var is a get only var or a get and set var. Once you declare a protocol like this, then other structs and classes and enums can essentially sign up to implement that protocol. Now, here I've got portable thing, which is signing up to implement the movable protocol. And you've actually seen this multiple times. I've used other terminology for it. For example, I might have said portable thing behaves like a movable or portable thing conforms to the movable protocol. I might even say portable thing is a movable. But all these are just terms for exactly the same thing, which is that portable thing is agreeing to implement all the vars and funks in this movable protocol. Now, it's also legal to create other protocols that require people who want to conform to them to also implement the vars and functions of another protocol. For example, I have protocol vehicle right here, and it says that it requires movable. And so anyone who wants to implement vehicle like this car at the bottom has to not only implement the passenger count var that's inside the vehicle protocol, but also all the vars and functions in the movable protocol. We call this protocol inheritance. And there's no reason that you can't sign up to implement multiple protocols. Like a car might be implementing the vehicle protocol, but also impoundable and leasable and things like that. It has to implement all the vars and functions and all of those things if it wants to be all of those things. So what is a protocol used for? And protocols can be used in lots of different ways. And some of them are very common in Swift UI. Some of them are pretty rare. So I'm going to go through them all and I'll try to emphasize which ones that you're going to encounter a lot and which ones you're almost never going to see. And let's start with the one you're almost never going to see, which is that a protocol is a type. That's why we're talking about it under the type, you know, list of types topic heading. And very rarely in Swift UI, you could use a protocol as a type itself. For example, you could have a function like travel around using movable, and the type of that argument is a protocol. Or you could even have an array of movables, and inside that array, you could have both cars and portable things. Now, this sounds all pretty exciting, but unfortunately, there's a big limitation, which is it doesn't work for all protocols. So, for example, it does not work with view or equatable or identifiable. Most of the things that we've seen so far, it doesn't work. And that's intentional by design in Swift UI. And so it's quite likely you'll go this entire course and never use a protocol as a type like this directly. So I mentioned that it's possible because it's an important part of being a protocol, I guess, but it's simply not used that much in Swift UI. So you really don't have to worry about this one. Now, the way that protocols are used that you do have to worry about and that you've seen already is to specify the behavior of a struct class or enum. This is struct emoji memory game view behaves like a view. It's the number one way we're going to use a protocol is to say that a struct behaves like something else. And we saw this another time here, which was class emoji memory game, our view model. It behaves like an observable object. And both of those structs were required to implement the vars and funks that were inside of it. In the case of view, it was that var body. 
in the case of the observable object, there was nothing, although the observable object was kind of interesting because there was a var there, object will change. Remember that? Object will change dot send that we were able to send when our model changes. Where is that? Is that in the protocol? Yes, it is, but it gets uh, implemented for us for free, and we're going to talk about how that happens a little bit later. But basically, using a protocol to define the behavior of a struct class or enum is one of the number one uses of a protocol. And we'll see some other protocols, view modifier, shape even in this lecture, app and scene. These are all protocols that you're going to be declaring classes or structs to behave like. And there's lighter weight little protocols that structs will say they behave like, like identifiable and hashable and equatable. There's one called custom string convertible that allows your struct to appear in the backslash open parentheses close parentheses inside a string and do some custom string there which is kind of fun and we'll see even more specialized ones later in the course like animatable these are all the same kind of thing where we're just saying that a struct or a class behaves like some protocol meaning it implements all those vars and functions but there are some other uses of protocols we've already seen another one which is turning a don't care into I care a little bit. We did this with our don't care in our memory game card content. We had to add this where card content is equatable or where card content behaves like an equatable because we needed to be able to do equals equals on the card content to see if the cards matched. Now being able to restrict don't cares like this is really at the heart of protocol oriented programming. And we're gonna be doing quite a bit more of this in the demo today. Another thing we can use in protocols is to restrict an extension to only work on certain things. Remember that we had that uh, array extension in our demo, one and only, and that extension worked on any array of anything. It could be array of string, it could be array of super complicated things, it doesn't matter, the one and only would work on it. But you could easily imagine wanting to extend array and do things, add functions that would really only make sense if the array held certain things. For example, maybe I'm going to add some functions that are doing some kind of lookup in a dictionary for the things in the array, and it only makes sense if the things in the array are hashable, right? We can hash them into a dictionary or something like that. So I can do that by just saying extension array where the elements conform to hashable. And then in my extension, I can put all the functions that I want, and those functions will only be available on arrays where the elements are hashable. It, it'll be almost like this extension doesn't exist if you had an array of things that weren't hashable. But that's not all that we can uh, use protocols to restrict. We can also restrict individual functions to only work with certain things. So we have an init right here, could be for any struct or class, and it takes this data, and the type of this data is a don't care. There's don't care what it is. However, this particular init will only work if that data conforms to the collection protocol, which is just a protocol that exists in foundation. Things like string and array conform to that protocol. And then I'm gonna say that the data's element since data is a collection, I know it has a don't care of its own called element because collection has a don't care called element. And I want that element to be identifiable. So by doing this, I've made it so you can only call this init if the data you're passing is a collection of identifiables. That's a really powerful way to be able to restrict your functions. And I've shown it for an init here, but it could easily just be a function of any kind. Uh, you can restrict them so that they're only going to take certain arguments. But protocols aren't used only for this restriction thing. They can also be used to just set up an agreement between two entities. For example, drop delegate. It's a protocol and it just lists all the functions that you need to implement. If you want drag and drop, which is picking things up in screen and drop them on you, if you want drag and drop, to work on you so that you can drop things on you. And so in this case, the protocol is doing nothing more than defining what those functions are and letting the code that's gonna receive the drop say, yeah, I sign up to do that. So you can ask me to handle a drop and I'll do it.
So that's a much simpler use of protocols than all that restriction stuff we saw. Now, one of the most powerful uses of protocols is actually to facilitate code sharing. Now, you might read that and think, oh, wait a second, <laughs> protocols have no code. They have no implementation, right? They're just bars and functions. How can we possibly share any code with a protocol? Well, I'm gonna put a line on here in just a second, and it's gonna be in red. And whenever you see something in red on these slides, you know to pay really close attention. And here it is. Implementation can be added to protocols by creating an extension on it. So if I add an extension to a protocol, just like I added an extension to the struct array for one and only, I can add an extension to a protocol and the functions and bars in that extension can have implementation, actual code that implements something. So believe it or not, this is how views get all their functions like foreground color, font, padding, all of those, they're being added being an extension to the view protocol. It's also how functions like filter and first index where and all those get added to all these structs like array and dictionary, etc. And an extension can also add default implementation for a func or a var in your protocol. So that's how observable object gets a default object will change for free. You could always add your own object will change to observable object if you wanted to, but you get this one for free because someone at Apple has kindly added an extension to observable object that adds that bar for you. Adding extensions to protocols to do this kind of code sharing is just key. It's fundamental to making this protocol-oriented programming that we're doing in Swift work. Now, having said that, you're not going to have to add extensions to protocols to make your code work. You're going to use the code that was added via extensions to protocols by Apple. Now, you could, and we will actually show sometime in the quarter using extensions to a protocol to do some stuff, but it's really not a primary thing you're going to do. It's more like it's a primary thing that Apple did to help create the libraries that you're going to use. And so we're just explaining it to you here so you understand what's going on and how this all is coming together, not so much that you're going to need to do your own extensions to protocols. Now let's take a moment here and talk about filter, that filter and first index where. Let's look at filter and see how it's added as an extension to a protocol. So here's what filter looks like. It works in array and range and string and dictionary, other things, set. And it's very simple. It just takes a function, this is included function, and it executes that on each element in the array or range or whatever, and it returns to you an array of all the things where that is included returned true. So this function, filter, was written once and only once by Apple. It only exists once. And yet somehow it works on array and range and string, all these completely different things. It's the same one function works in all of them. How is that possible? Well, filter was added to the foundation library as an extension to the sequence protocol. The sequence protocol is something that array and range and string, dictionary set all conform to. And because they conform to sequence, they automatically get filter since filter was added as an extension to sequence. In object-oriented programming, we'd have had to make all those things, range, array, etc., inherit from some common base class or something to get them all to have this. And especially with single inheritance, that would be pretty darn messy and complicated. This protocol mechanism is a much more straightforward way to do that. So those are all the ways that we'll use protocols to do things. I'm going to try and wrap up all those different ways into one conceptual how to think about it framework, which is I'm gonna use the phrase constraints and gains. <laughs> I use this because it rhymes, constraints and gains, so hopefully you remember it. But what I mean by that is if I have a struct Tesla here and it conforms to the vehicle protocol, well, Tesla is constrained to have to implement everything in vehicle because it claimed it was a vehicle, so it has to implement all the bars and funks in there, but it gains all the capability that a vehicle has gotten by people adding extensions to that protocol. So for example, if I wrote an extension to vehicle that added register with DMV to it and put all the code in there to register 
to the DMV. Now Teslas have gained the ability to register with the DMV. And all they had to do to gain that is to implement all of the functions and bars in vehicle. Now you've already seen the world's greatest example of constraints and gains, it's view. So here we have card view and it's declaring that it implements the protocol view. Now, since it claims to implement this protocol, it's constrained to implement all of the view protocols, functs, and bars. And luckily, the only one it has to do is bar body. So once card view implements body, it now fully conforms to view. And then it gains tons and tons of functions like foreground color and padding and all that, just by virtue of the fact that it is itself a view. So what's going on behind the scenes, really, in the Swift UI library? Well, here's some kind of pseudo code of it. It doesn't look exactly like this, but it's somewhat like this. You know, view is just a protocol, and in that protocol is var body. And then there's some extension to view that has a func foreground color uh, that returns some view, and it's some implementation. It's got a func font, and a func blur, and with dozens of other functions and it's got implementations for them all. And so the first part there, the protocol view, is, is the thing that's going to constrain card view to have to provide that body var. And then the second part there is the gains that card view gets by being a view. Now, the code above is a little bit <laughs> simplified, um, but conceptually, that's what's going on here. So why do we do protocols, okay? Why do we do all this stuff? Well, protocols are primarily a way for types, structs, classes, enums to say what they are capable of, and also for other code to demand certain behavior out of the other type. But neither side has to reveal what sort of struct or class they are. We're focusing on the functionality here. We're hiding all the implementation details of structs and classes behind it. It's really the promise of encapsulation that we had from object-oriented programming but it's taken to a much higher level here. Let's make one more pass through all this protocol stuff by taking a closer look at identifiable, which is gonna lead us to hashable, which is gonna lead us to equatable. And each of these three protocols has something to teach us about protocols in general. First of all, let's talk about generics and protocol. The identifiable protocol actually has a don't care. That ID that we have to provide that identifies our identifiable thing is a don't care for identifiable. So yes, protocols can have don't cares as well, just like structs and classes. But the syntax for a don't care in protocols is a little bit different. You don't use the angle brackets like we did, you know, memory game, angle brackets, card content. We don't do that. Instead, we add this line associated type into the protocol and that says, this is a don't care for me. So you, you expect that to be kind of protocol identifiable angle brackets ID, uh, but it's not. It's associated type I, ID in there. Now, as we learned in this demo earlier, this type ID in identifiable really has to be a hashable thing. It doesn't really make sense to have something be identifiable by something you couldn't look up in a hash table or something. We're trying to identify the thing. So we require that it be hashable. How do we specify that? How do we make it so that that ID don't care is hashable? Well, that's really straightforward to do. We're going to constrain the ID don't care to behave like a hashable. So we can do that by saying the associated type ID where ID is hashable. That's similar to how we would do it with a class or a struct, or even more simply, we could say associated type ID is a hashable, which is how we would do it, much simpler that way. And we just turn that ID don't care into an ID we care a little bit. We care that it's a hashable. So what is hashable? Let's take a look at that thing. Hashable is a simple protocol. It has one function in it called hash into, and it gives you this hasher that you use to combine all of your variables into a single little hash code. And I'm not gonna really go over how hash tables work. Hopefully you know how they work, but you just basically wanna look that code up in some table. So you can see the code here of making this struct foo be hashable. I just implement the hash into 
function and inside I'm using this combine function on the hasher to combine my variables my into my string into a hash code and that's it that's pretty much all there is to hashable but there's something to consider about hashable things when you hash something you take a complicated thing and you hash it down into a simple int or some simple code it's not impossible that two very complicated things might hash to exactly the same thing that is possible when you're hashing so you need to be able to then verify that they're different things using equality using equals equals so that's why the hashable protocol has an inherent relationship to the equatable protocol so if you want to say something is hashable it also has to be equatable so we can make sure that it's actually a different thing even if it has the same hash code as something else so this is a good practical example of protocol inheritance that we talked about at the very beginning and that begs the question what is this equatable thing we already know a little bit about equatable because we used it with our card content we know that if you say that you're equatable then you can have equals equals work on you so how does that work well swift is really smart when you do equals equals it will call the function that's in the equatable protocol on your type this is a static funk so it's called on your type and yes equals equals is a perfectly reasonable name for a function in swift even flame emoji is a legal swift function name although i don't recommend it generally and this little static function just takes a left hand side and a right hand side that's what lhs and rhs are and notice the types of the left hand side and right hand side it's capital s self now capital s self means the actual type that is implementing equatable so when you implement equatable in a struct you replace that capital s self with your struct type now this kind of capital s self referencing protocol cannot be used as a normal type in other words you can't say var x is an array of equatable so even though equatable is a protocol protocols are a type at the very beginning of this protocol section i said well sometimes you can do that well these self-referencing protocols like equatable you can't do that and it makes sense right to have an array of equatable what if you had a car that's equatable against other cars and you had a chair that's equatable against other chairs you couldn't have an array that had a car and a chair in it because you wouldn't know how to equate them to each other there's no equals equals function anywhere where the left hand side is a car and the right hand side is a chair that just doesn't exist so that's why these kind of self-referencing protocols cannot be used as just a normal type inside of an array or as the argument to a function. And it explains why you're never going to see code that says var my view is of type view because view is a self-referencing protocol and so it can't be used as a type like that. Now Swift is even friendlier for you than doing the trick of when you use equals equals it calls this function in the equatable protocol. If you declare a struct to be equatable and all of its vars are themselves equatable, then Swift will implement that equals equals function for you. So for example, our cards, if we just said comma equatable at the top there, just said that they were equatable, card one equals equals card two would now be legal because all of the vars is face up, is match and ID, those are all simple types that are equatable and our card content we know that's equatable because we said it had to be equatable by using that where clause so our entire card contains equatable things and therefore just saying that it's equatable will make it equatable without even having to implement that static funk which is kind of a cool feature and if you do need to implement that little equals equals static funk uh, on your struct which you might have to do if you have a var that's not itself equatable and so you have to somehow figure out what it means for two of your structs to be equatable then you can use that command click menu the same one we used to do rename and all that in xcode to put a little stub for the equals equals in there for you which is kind of nice get you started okay so that is it on protocols and generics and how they work together so for some of you, your head might be spinning a little bit right now. You might be thinking, 
how am I going to design systems using protocols with generics? And oh my, it's just, whew. And this is indeed a very powerful foundation for designing things. Surprisingly simple though, but can be used very powerfully. And there's no doubt that it does require some experience for sure to master it all. But the good news is you can do a lot in Swift UI without having to master all this. Most of the mastery of this has been done by the Swift UI designers themselves. You are kind of at the end point of it where you're using all the stuff they've built. You're not necessarily having to build a lot more of this reusable code and generic protocols and all that. But as you do use it, I want you to understand what's going on. So that's why I explained it all to you. Um, no one expects you to be able to be adding extensions to protocols with generics. But, you know, eventually you will be able to because you'll see it more and more and you'll start to understand it better. But in the meantime, uh, you'll at least have some idea how Swift is doing all this stuff. Um, and in any case, as usual, this will probably all make a lot more sense with a demo. So let's do that now. Okay, our goal for this demo is to learn more about protocols. And one of the really good ways to do that is to try and understand more how these view combiners accept their arguments because protocols are very much involved in that. So the change we're gonna to make to memorize in order to demonstrate all that is to fix the display here so that if we have a lot of cards like this, we don't scroll. Instead, it makes the card smaller. Now, what would be really great is if Swift UI had a view combiner that just did that, kept the cards all the same aspect ratio and resized them so they would fit on screen without scrolling. But there's no such thing. So we're going to write that for ourselves. And by writing our own view combiner, we're going to really see how these arguments get passed. And as part of doing that, we're going to have to learn a lot about protocols. So let's start by just imagining that such a view combiner existed, a view combiner that kept all the cards the right size to fit them all on screen with a certain aspect ratio. You know, what would that look like if it just existed? Well, it would replace all of these, the scroll view with the lazy V grid and this for each. We're going to replace all of these. In fact, I'm going to comment that out. And I'm going to start typing as if I already had this view combiner that I wanted. And I'm going to call this thing aspect V grid because it's still going to be a V grid and it has got columns and the things go down from there. But I'm calling it aspect, that's sort of short for aspect ratio because it uses an aspect ratio to pick the size of the views in there, in this case, our cards. So what kind of arguments would my view combiner need? Well, it definitely would need the items, in this case, our cards. The whole point of this thing is to take things like our cards and make views for them and make them fit in a nice V grid. So we definitely need that. And I've obviously got to have the aspect ratio, which in our case is two to three, because it's an aspect ratio V grid. That's how it decides what the size of the cards are. It maintains a certain aspect ratio. And then, of course, it needs the content, which is a function that returns a view. It's the same thing we've been passing to every single one of these other view combiners. We're going to do the same thing. We have this content. And in our case, the content is this card view. And of course, the card view depends on getting the card back. So I am passing the cards to it but I need the card back, just like I passed them to for each, and for each gave me the card back. So I need this card argument here. That's it, this is what I'm trying to build. So the only error we get here is, cannot find aspect vgrid in scope because no such thing exists. So let's create it. File, new file. Now this aspect vgrid is a Swift UI view. All these view combiners themselves are Swift UI view. So we don't have to choose Swift file here. We can choose Swift UI view and it'll give us a little bit of template for it. We wanna always make sure we put it in the same place as other, other Swift files. We're gonna call it aspect v grid. Check the group. Yep, looked good. And here's our aspect v grid. You can see it made a file for it. I'm gonna 
close this so we keep as much space as possible. Now, as I write the code for this, I want to keep in mind the code where I'm using it from. So I'm going to close my preview momentarily. And I'm going to split my screen in two and have this aspect of eGrid code on one side and the place where I'm using it on the other. You do that with this little plus button right here. Boom, creates another window for you here. And you can just switch over to aspect view grid calls site. So we just need to make all these arguments work. Let's start by just making the arguments. We'll do those like we do arguments to any other view. Var items is going to have to be something. Var aspect ratio, that's a CG float. Everything we do with drawing are CG floats. And then var content, that's this content argument right here. And the real key to getting this going here is what are these types right here, items and content? Well, items, similar to when we pass to for each, right? Items is our cards. In a way for us, in Aspect V Grid, this is a don't care. We really don't care what this is. It can be essentially an array of anything. I'm just going to make up a type here called item. And when I make up a type, we call it a don't care. I always have to put it up here in angle brackets. Just to let the world know that this combiner view that we're creating has a don't care in it called item. And that's what these are going to be. So when we create this aspect grid, that don't care is going to be card because we're passing an array of cards here. What about this content? Well, this content is a function, so it's going to be something looks kind of like a function of some sort. It has an argument. See that card right there? What type is this argument? It is the type of the things in here, which is type item. And what about return? What does it return? Well, it returns a view right here. There's returns this card view we're going to use for each of the items here in our items. So what do we do here? Can we say returns a view? Ah, we can't do that. The view is a behavior. It's a protocol, a constraints and gains thing. And it's self-referential. We talked about that in the slides. It's like equatable. It refers to itself. So you can't use it as a type like this. So how about some view? That's what we used down here with var body, just some view. Well, that doesn't work here either, because remember, some view just means go look in here see what this is and replace this with whatever you find here. Well, there's nothing for it to look at here. There's no way for the compiler to figure out what some view is and replace it. So some view just can't be used in this kind of environment. But we really don't have to do any of that because this view right here, it's really a don't care for us. It could be a rectangle, it could be a card view, it could be a Z stack. So this needs to be another don't care. And I'm going to call it item view and just put it up here as another don't care. Now, this would almost be enough right here. There's only one small thing we have to do, which is that this item view is not a complete don't care. We do care that it's a view. So this has to be a view. Just like over in our model, when we had our card content, we wanted to be able to say equals equals on it. So we said, yeah, where that card content behaves like an equatable, so we can do equals equals. We're going to do the same kind of where thing over here by saying where our item view behaves like a view. And that's all we need to do to ensure that this content function that they pass us returns something that is a view. So let's build this and see where we still have errors. No more errors over here. That's nice. Ooh, we got errors down here, though. Our previews for the aspect B grid. Oh, yeah, there's no item. I'm not passing any of the parameters to it. Uh, that's a problem. When you're building a generic view combiner like this, you are want, going to want to build a nice preview that has a lot of test data down here and calls it with different kinds of items and aspect ratios and all that. But we clearly don't have time to do that in our demo. So for now, I'm just going to comment this out. But this thing is still going to preview when we preview this view over here. And that's how we're going to be knowing if what we're doing is working. Now, what's interesting is this is compiled now. If I hit build, 
build succeeded. So we've got this essentially completely working, except it only says hello world. So now we need to start using these arguments that we're passing over here to build our body. Our aspect V grid is primarily a lazy V grid. That's what it is. And it's the same kind of lazy V grid before where we have a grid item that's adaptive and it's got some minimum width but this width is now the key to our aspect v grid we have to pick a width so that all these items fit with this aspect ratio without scrolling so that is really what we're doing is making this width work we're gonna have to say let width cg float equal something okay we'll say 100 for now but we're gonna have to calculate this based on how many items we got and how much space available, etc. Now what's inside this lazy V grid? Well, it's just all these views for our items. So we did this before, we're gonna say for each, all of our items, it's gonna pass that item back to us and we're going to have to provide a view for it. Now, how do we provide a view for each item? Well, that's what our content is. Our content is a function that takes an item and returns an item view. So we could just say here, content taking an item, and this will return the item view. Simple as that. Only one other thing we have is this aspect ratio. That's aspect ratio of that aspect ratio. And we'll use the content mode dot fit. And this is it. This is the real heart of what our aspect V grid does. We still have some work to do because of this width 100. And I notice we have an error right here. Let's make some space, see what this error is. Oh no, we've seen this before. Referencing initializer on for each requires that item conform to identifiable. And we have an array of items here we're passing to our for each. For each requires that all of the things in this array be identifiable. So oh, how are we gonna do that? This item is a don't care for us. How can we make sure that it's identifiable? Well, exactly the same thing up here, right? We're just gonna say where our items are constrained to be identifiable. This way, no one can create an aspect V grid unless they provide us some items that are identifiable so that we can then pass them on to for each. Look, okay, we're back to full compiling, no errors. This all works fine. Our items are cards, cards are in fact identifiable. So everybody is happy over here. So let's go back and take a look at our UI. I'm gonna bring this back and I'm gonna pin it. We'll try again. And it does seem like it is putting them in the grid. So that's good. And so our next step is to replace this 100 with some calculation that picks the size of the card based on the space available. Now we're always constrained on time in these demos, so we're not gonna go through the logic it takes to pick the right width here. I went and prepared some code that does that. I called it width that fits. It's pretty straightforward code. I kind of intentionally wrote it in this little bit non-mathematical way so that you could go through it and convince yourself that it actually calculates the width that fits. But I did have to make one simplifying assumption when I wrote this code, and that's that there's no spacing in between here. When you put the spacing in, as you can imagine, it adds a little more math involved to try and figure out how many cards will fit in a certain aspect ratio. So I assumed we had no spacing vertically or horizontally, in other lazy V grid. So we need to go turn all that off. So how do we turn off the spacing in a lazy V grid? Well, we can turn off the spacing between the rows by just saying spacing zero. So now there's no spacing in between. And the, the spacing in between, right, this vertical spacing in between there, that's actually determined by the grid items. So I'm gonna have to make my grid item set its spacing. So I'm gonna copy that out and create a little function called adaptive grid item for the that width that we want private bunk adaptive grid item for certain width which is a seed float returns a grid item for us it just does that 
same thing we were doing before var grid item equals that but i'm going to set the grid items spacing equal to zero and return the grid item so that's all this function does it does exactly the same thing we we're doing before but it sets that grid item spacing to zero so now there's no spacing in either direction we resume we'll actually see that see no spacing in there now we can use padding to make this fit that's easy enough we'll go here and say dot padding let's say four we don't want too much padding in there that looks good by the way we don't need this aspect ratio here anymore because the aspect v grid gives us that aspect ratio so we can just get rid of that and now let's just call this width that fits now that we've turned off all the spacing instead of 100 width that fits the item count that's our items dot count the size is our oh we need our geometry dot size so we're gonna have to get a geometry reader there and the aspect ratio is the aspect ratio the user wants so we're almost there we just need our geometry dot size that's easy we know how to do a geometry reader that's the geometry proxy here and we'll just put our code inside there now we know what size we are and bam it worked look at that all the cards got size to be smaller and they fit we can jump over here to our memory game and change the number of cards so that's eight cards let's go down seven cards and resume and six cards resume. six cards the cards got larger five four three two one card we'll go back up to what were we at uh, eight or nine 10 11 oh 12 13 14 15 15 17 oh this next one 18 much smaller 19 20 now i'm seeing something i don't like these cards don't look that good when they're really small so we have some more tweaking to do i think the emojis are still slightly too big and this rounded uh, rectangle uh, radius of 20 is too big a radius for small cards so those are easy fixes to make now that we have the constants down here i can just make the corner radius 10 let's say and we'll make our font scale let's just go down a little bit maybe 0.75 and resume and that looks pretty good I think they're fitting pretty well and that rounded edge looks better we could even go back and make sure that it looks good when there's fewer cards so they're larger yeah i think that smaller radius looks good on big cards and small cards one other small change i want to make is in my aspect v grid here you see lazy v grid it is not flexible in size it sizes itself to its items and so we have a situation here where we have a geometry reader and what's inside of it is not flexible in size now it seems to be doing the right thing here for us i guess aligning it at the top of the space available but just as a matter of good habit i like to make sure that the things in my geometry reader are flexible in size and that's easy to do here i'm just going to turn this into a v stack with my lazy v grid at the top and then a spacer and i'm even going to make my spacer min length zero i don't need the space i just want to make sure there's something flexible in here to turn this flexible so that this geometry reader has something flexible because again the geometry reader is going to accept all the space offered to it and then it's going to offer all that space here and even if this person doesn't take it this is still taking all the space this way it's very predictable and clear to anyone reading our code that we expect that this lazy fee grid is going to be tipped up to the top of whatever space is available here okay there's one more thing i want to show you which is view builder so we talked about view builder at the end of lecture five and we would like to accept view builders here but we don't currently we only accept functions that take an item and return a view and we're constraining the item view to be a view but we're not saying that it's allowed to be a view builder and view builder is not a behavior thing. It's not a constraints and gains thing. It's an at sign view builder. So it's an extra keyword that's added to cause the compiler to interpret a function as a view builder. So where do we 
plug it in here. Well, let's start by showing an example of where we would want a view builder. Because right now, our content right here just contains a single view. But this might want to be a view builder. For example, you know that down here when our card is matched and face down, we take it away. What if we had put that code up here instead? It said something like, if the card is matched and the card is not face up, then we're just going to put a rectangle that is fully transparent, opacity zero. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and put our card view in here. As soon as I put that in there, I'm getting this error. This does not conform to view. And in fact, it doesn't conform to view because this is not a view builder function. And so this is not even a well-formed function, let alone uh, something that conforms to view. So how do we make it so that our content argument is a function that can be interpreted as a view builder where we can use the ifs and list views and things like that? It's pretty simple, but it does require us in our aspect vgrid to have an init. And this init is just going to take all the same arguments and it's going to assign them to the self versions of all of those. So I haven't really done anything new here. It doesn't really do anything new, but I have gotten an error. It says assigning a non-escaping parameter content to an escaping closure. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, this closure, this function that gets passed in, escapes from this context because it gets assigned to this variable and held onto and then used later when we build our body. So whenever you have a function that you're passing that escapes, you have to mark it at sign escaping. There's really two reasons to do this. One is so people who are calling your initializer here know, oh, he's going to hold on to this function that I'm passing him to create a view, which they're going to always assume, but still, you want to know that. And also the compiler wants to know this because if you're not going to hold on to this, if it's not going to escape, then it could probably inline this function. Just execute it right in line, wouldn't have to go create memory for it. Because functions are types, just like a struct is a type, classes are typed. And we know that structs and enums are value types. They don't live in the heap. They are just copied around. But we know classes are reference types. They have pointers to them in memory. Well, closures, function types, are reference types. They actually live in the heap and are pointed to. This is a pointer to this function living in the heap. So for the compiler to not create that memory and just inline this, it needs to know whether this is escaping. So now we're back to where we were before. Everything compiles. We haven't changed our code over here at all. We still have this error that this function is not returning a view. And what we want to say is, well, please interpret this function that returns a view as a view builder. We do that right here by saying that this content argument is a view builder. This makes it so that the compiler will interpret whatever function is passed here as a view builder. So we go back here and we build and it's going to build just fine. This is a valid view builder. It just has ifs to choose which things there are. Hasn't changed the way our code works. Everything is working just fine. There's one other place you can use this at sign view builder keyword, which is on a function. So let's say that we thought that our body here was starting to get a little bit long, that we wanted to take this out, factor it out, and put it into its own little private func called card view or card. Return some view. We just wanted to plop that code in there and up here say card view for that card. And this would all be perfectly legal, nice way to make body, very clear and easy to read, very few lines of code here. But if we build, it fails. First, it fails because we used card. Really, we have to say emoji memory 
game.card. But even once we fix that and build, we get another error here that says function declares an opaque return type but has no return statement. It's basically saying this is not a valid function, which it's not. There's not no return statement. It's supposed to return some view. Oh, what's going on? This, of course, is a view builder. But we haven't told Swift that this function uses view builder syntax for the code inside it. But we can do that too by just saying at sign view builder. And this causes the compiler when we build to come along and say, oh, okay, this funk is a view builder. So I'm going to look in here and assume that this is a view builder. So it can have ifs and lets and lists of views, normal view builder syntax. So those are the two places you'll see view builder here on funks and when arguments are being passed that will accept a view builder for you. I actually think I prefer this the way it was, putting the card right up here in line instead of using that view builder function. Now that we've got our aspect V grid working, let's get rid of all this commented out code. And we can also clean up a little bit more using our trailing closure syntax here that we can use with all of our view combiners. Let's resume. Let's get our app back in working order here by having our cards all start face down. And we'll build, resume again, Start our cards, and let's try a match. Ooh, the cards disappeared. Seems to be working just fine. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears a little bit and go talk about shapes. So a shape is a protocol that inherits from view. In other words, all shapes are also views. You've seen a number of shapes already, rounded rectangle, circle, etc. By default, we know that shapes draw themselves by filling themselves with the current foreground color, but we've already seen that that can be changed with dot stroke and dot fill and dot stroke border. And these things return a view that draws the shape in the specified way, filled or stroked with color or whatever. Now the arguments to stroke and fill are pretty interesting. We saw a simple argument with to stroke, which was line width, but you can actually pass to both of them more complicated things like gradients and image paint and color, which will stroke or fill them with that particular style. Now you might think that the way this is implemented in shape is that there's a version of the fill function that takes a color and there's a different version of the fill function that takes a gradient. And there's another version of the fill function that takes some image paint to draw with. But that's not actually the case. The fill function actually takes a don't care. Yes, functions can be generic as well. And they use the same kind of syntax with fill angle bracket S there, meaning this function fill has a don't care called S and its argument is actually that don't care type. So really fill is saying here, oh, call me and I don't care what the argument is, what type the argument is. You can pass anything you want, except we got a where clause over there that says where this S don't care conforms to shape style. And shape style is a protocol that essentially knows how to take a shape and turn it into a view by applying some sort of shape style. That's why it's called shape style. And so some examples of things that implement the shape style protocol are color. So color, very simple shape style, takes the shape and fills it with that color and voila. But there's also image paint, which takes an image and paints it into the shape or angular or linear gradients, which draw a gradient across the filling of the shape. So I brought this up mostly just to show you that functions are allowed to have these don't cares as well, not just classes and structs and protocols can have don't cares, but functions too. And you're gonna run across this in the documentation. For example, go look at the documentation for fill in shape and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So you need to understand that the don't cares work there as well. All right, but on to our main thing of shape here, which is what if we wanna create our own shape? Well, the shape protocol 
by extension, obviously, implements views body var for you, right? Shape is a view, but you don't have to do the var body when you're implementing your own shape because shape does it for you. But of course, shape has its own function in its protocol, which is path in rect, and that returns a path struct. So this path struct is a pretty cool struct and has a lot of functions on it for drawing. Draw a line to here, draw an arc over here. And I'm not gonna go over any of that. I want you to go to the documentation and look at path and see all the things you can do. And of course, we're gonna do a demo where we draw something and you really get an idea of some of the things the path can do. So let's dive right into a demo and see how we make our own shape. Let's start by reminding ourselves what it is we're trying to do here. If I go back to the version of Memorized from the start of the quarter that we're hoping to build by the end of the quarter, go to Vehicles here and click on a card. There it is, this little pinkish pie that's counting down right here. That's what we're trying to build. Now today, we're just going to build the pie, and next week, we'll do all the animation and I'm making it count down. I flipped one of these cards over, and I grabbed a screenshot of it halfway through its countdown or partway through its countdown so that we can refer to it as we're building this little shape for ourselves. So that is over here. It's the bike. We're building this. You can see why I call it a pie shape. It looks like a pie with a piece taken out right here. And we're going to want the size of this piece right here to be totally configurable. So we have big piece of the pie taken out or maybe almost the whole pie except for a little sliver. So we've got some work to do to make that. But let's actually start by just trying to get a circle to appear behind our emoji. If I can start with getting a circle, then I can replace it with a pie and go from there. By now, putting a circle in here should be old hat for you, should have no problem. We're gonna go down to our card view and find out where our face up card is, because this little pie obviously only appears on face up cards. Here it is, card is face up. It's these three views, uh, the two background views and the text. And to put a circle, we're just gonna drop a circle right in between those two things. Oh, oh no, this is a bit of a problem. Every time I change my code and I'm in live preview mode, this resets and rebuilds. And so my car goes back face down. So I have to click it back face up to see it. Now, I'm sort of happy here because I'm starting to get a circle, but I'm not too excited about the prospect of having to click back over here, click back over here every single time I change my code. I'd really like this to stay face up as I'm doing all my work here. So how do we do that? Well, we're just going to remind ourselves that what appears here in the preview is controlled by what's down here. This is why we have a dark mode one and a light mode one. Here is our dark mode, here's our light mode. And we just create an empty game and show it in both cases. But there's absolutely no reason we couldn't say something like game choose the games cards dot first just choose that first card and then return our emoji game view and maybe we'll get rid of our dark versions and now we have this nice version of our preview that is always showing the first card even when we make changes to our code it's always going to be showing this so you always want to think of your previews place as you know, a testing bed, place where you're going to change things. Maybe we want to choose two or three cards and see what happens here. And of course, we can have multiple previews, one preview that chooses one card, another preview that chooses two cards, etc. So don't forget about that when you're testing and developing your application. All right. So this circle came out pretty good. It's, it's pretty close here. Let's even zoom in so we can get a good look at what we're doing here. But there's a couple of things I don't like about this circle. It's really close to the edge. If you remember this one over here, there was a little gap between the edges. I don't want that. And then this red is this fully saturated bright red that the, is the back of the cards and the edge. I kind of want the timer to be not that prominent, so I had it fade out into the background a little bit here and be a little uh, faded out. So we actually know a way to fix both of those things. 
the space around the edge, how about we just put some padding around our circle? Well, uh, that's a little too much padding. I don't want to make my emoji so small that it would fit in there. So let's back this padding off. Maybe we only want one point of padding. Not enough. How about seven points? And maybe too much. Five, something like that. This is a number we're going to have to play with. And this blue number will eventually end up down here in our constants. And speaking of our constants, I think that this is about as big as I can make my circle, but my emoji doesn't quite fit all the way in. Having it touch on the edges there, don't like that. I'm going to go back to my constants, which I kind of like to think of this as the knobs that I turn to tune my UI. I'm going to back this off maybe to 65% and resume. And maybe that's too small. How about 70%? Okay, I think that'll work. Now, I'm going to have to look at a lot of emoji on this pie background and see how they look to come to a final decision on this, but this is a pretty good start right here. Let's go and make this red thing a little more transparent so it's showing through to its white background more. Do that with opacity, and we'll start maybe 0 0.1, that's 10% opacity, at too light, obviously. So let's move up here, 0.2. That's better. 0.3, mm, 0.4, oh, I think we're getting close here. 0 0.5, 0 0.6, uh, 0.6 might be too dark. Yeah, I think 0.6 is too dark. So let's back it up to 0.5. And again, of course, we will be putting this down in here in constants as well. I'm not gonna do that in the demo to save time, but you know how to do that already. So I think we're ready now to dive into actually making this be a pie instead of being a circle. Unfortunately, there's no pie shape in Swift UI, so we're going to have to invent our own shape. And how do we do that? Well, file, new, file. And shapes are Swift UI views, we know that. But if I choose this template, I'm going to get the var body thing. And we know that the shape protocol implements var body for us by extension, and that it has its own functions. So we're going to just do Swift file here. Put it in the right place, put it in the right group. We're going to call it pi. Does look like a pi with a piece missing. Here it is, created a file for us, pi.swift. And we are obviously shapes our UI thing, so we want this to import Swift UI. And creating a shape is really simple struct pi, it's a shape. And when we do this, we're gonna get this error right off the bat that pi does not conform to the shape protocol because shape has a function. And if you conform to a protocol, if you behave like something, you have to implement all of its functions. And there's a cool way to get that. I think we might've showed this earlier in the quarter. If you get this error where something doesn't conform, you can hit fix and get that thing added. Now, that fix doesn't always work because some protocols are a little bit complicated in the way they're set up with their don't cares and all that, but it works great with shape. Now, this path, remember, is gonna return a struct here, this path struct. The path is simply a series of drawing instructions to draw a shape. So for us, these are instructions are gonna be to draw this pie-shaped thing. So we're gonna have to figure out what instructions to do that, but that's all that's being required of us here. And they're giving us the space in which we're drawing right here, the space that was offered to our view essentially in this rectangle. We haven't really seen CG rect. I think we've seen CG size, CG point maybe, and certainly CG float, all those four CG things. I think I mentioned there was only three last time. I'm not sure which one I left out. There's four, CG rect, CG size, CG point, and CG float. Those are the basic data types for all of our drawing. And we can take a quick look at CG Rect in the documentation. It has a lot of cool inits. Probably the basic init is you give the origin of the rectangle as a CG point and its size as a CG size. And there's special recs like CG Rect.0 is a zero size rect. And you can get the origin and size back anytime. You can get the width and height of it. 
There's actually a couple of interesting bars down here that might help us, like mid X gives you the middle of the rectangle in the X direction, middle in the Y direction. So we'll be using these CG rect and CG point and CG size all over the place when we are making our own shapes and doing our own drawing. So how do we make a path here and return it? Let's start by making the path. I'm just going to have a var p, which I'm going to set equal to a new path. So that's a new empty path. I'm going to return it. Right now, our shape does nothing. It's got an empty path. Inside here, we have to call functions on this p, this path, to move around and draw our lines and whatever that are in our shape. So let's talk about our strategy here for drawing this shape. I thought about this some, and the simplest way to do it is to move to the center of the space that I'm drawing in right here, and then draw a line up to this very important point, which I'm going to call my start point. And then from the start point, I'm going to go around this arc, and then I'm simply going to draw a line back to the center. So that should be a pretty simple series of drawing instructions to get this thing to draw. Now to do that, I obviously need to get some information. One is where is my center? And also what is the radius of this circle? I can't clearly not going to be able to draw an arc here without knowing the radius of my circle. Plus I can't calculate where the start point is unless I know the radius of my circle. But the center point and this radius really depend on how much space I'm offered. The center point is just the center of the space I'm offered, so that's easy to calculate. And the radius is really the width or the height of my space. That, that's the diameter, so my radius is half of that. But it's got to be the smaller of the two, because if I had my diameter be the entire height, then my circle oh, would start going outside on the sides. So I have to pick the smaller of the two. And my cards are you know, have a ratio of two wide to three high, but I could have my cards be other heights. And so I wouldn't want my pie not to work in other card shapes. So we're going to pick the minimum of the width or height and take half of that. And that's going to be our radius. And we're just going to have the start be in the center. So let's create a couple of local variables to do those two things. We're going to let the center equal a CG point. CG points have an X and Y value. And our X value is just going to be the rect that we're being asked to draw in middle point and the y is going to be the rect we're being asked to draw in mid y so that's this rectangle here that's this rectangle over here and we're just getting the midpoint these were a couple of the bars that we saw when we looked in the documentation for cg rect radius well as i said it is going to be the minimum of our rex width and our rex height and that's the diameter, so we divide by 2 to get our radius. Now we have really two key pieces of information that we need to draw our shape. Let's go down to our path and get started. We're going to start by just moving to the center. You can kind of think of the way paths draw as a, you're drawing with a pen, and you can lift the pen up and move it, or you can leave the pen down and add lines and arcs. We're going to start with the pen up by just moving to the center. Do that with p.move to the point we want, which is our center. The next move is to draw a line up to here. So drawing a line is a little different than moving. We're going to use this function add line to, as you'll see. But I need this key point, this star point right here. To calculate this star point, I actually need a little bit of trigonometry. Because I want this angle that we're heading up up here and the angle that we're coming back in here to be configurable. Because eventually this is going to be animated pi. And so these angles, one or both of them, might be moving as this counts down. So we've got a little bit of work to do. Two things, really. One, we've got to add some sort of start and end angles here as configurable properties. And then we've got to do the trigonometry to figure out what is this point right here to start our arc. Let's add those angles that we need to be configurable. We need the start angle to be something, and we need the end angle to be something. And the good question here of what should this type be, and you might be thinking, ah, CG float, because I told you there's four CG things, and CG float is one of them. It's clearly not a size that would go here. 
Uh, but actually what we're going to put here is an angle. Angle is a really nice type in Swift that lets you encapsulate an angle. Let's take a look at this in the documentation. Here it is, struct angle. It's got a lot of nice greater than and less than, and you can make ranges of angles, and you can initialize them with degrees or with radians. That's kind of cool. And no matter which one you initialize it with, you can get the degrees or the radians back out of it. So that's kind of fun. And oh, look at this animatable data. I bet that's going to be valuable to us next week when we're trying to animate the angle of this pi as it counts down. So now we know the start angle, which is the angle out of the center to go up here. And we know the end angle, the one we're finishing with here. How do we find this point? It's time to do a little tiny bit of trigonometry. Some of you might be a couple of years removed from your trigonometry classes, but it's not too bad. We're gonna create a start point here by saying CG point, and we're gonna put it on multiple lines just to make it as clear as possible. We need the X value for this CG point, and we need the Y value of it. And the X value is just our center's X, plus we're gonna take our radius and multiply it by the cosine of our start angle in radians. Cosine is a built-in function in Swift. It takes its angle argument in radians. So we have to use the radians version of our start angle there. And then the Y is just the center dot Y plus the radius times the sine of the start angle radians. So again, if it's been a while since you've done any trigonometry, you can spend some time offline to convince yourself that this indeed does give us this point right here, the start point up here. Now we have an error. It's a little bit of a hard to understand error. It says type of expression is ambiguous without more context. It, it truly means the type. It can't figure out what type is going on inside here. And the reason for that is that CG point, CG rect, all drawing is in CG floats, but start angle dot radians is a double. So cosine of a double is also a double. And we're trying to multiply a CG float, our radius, it is a CG float because they got the rect dot width, so that's all CG floats, times a double. Swift does not know how to multiply types of different type, just can't do it. So somehow we have to convert this cosine from a double into a float. How do we do type conversion in Swift? There's really no way to do it. So what we do is we create a new CG float. We use a CG float initializer here to create a brand new one that takes a double as its argument and returns a CG float. Luckily, CG float does have an initializer that takes a double, so we're winning here. And we'll do the same thing down here. Type conversion in Swift happens by creating new structs passing the argument of the thing you want to convert. So if there's no initializer that takes the type of thing you want to convert in the type you're trying to create, then you're kind of out of luck, unfortunately, in Swift. Of course, Swift has an enormous number of initializers that do type conversion, so you're rarely going to be out of luck. Don't worry. This is that start point then, all in nice CG types up here. So next this thing we want to do is add a line to there. Super simple, p dot add line to. We're going to go up to that start point. Next, we're going to go around this circle, which you might think, oh man, this is going to be tough. This is actually super easy because this path, its whole purpose is drawing things. So it has very powerful primitives like p dot add arc. And if we look at the options for adding an arc, there's a number of different ways to specify the arc, tangents, or this one right here, which is what we want. This one lets us specify the center of the arc, the radius of the arc, the start and end angles, which are going to be type angle, so that's really nice for us, and whether to go clockwise around the arc or counterclockwise. So let's pick this one. I'll even spread this out a little so we can see it a little better. And let's fill in all of these arguments. The center of our arc that we're building, of course, is the our center. That's really easy, this thing we calculated up here. The radius, huh, we calculated that too. Start angle, hmm, start angle. That is the angle that we want to start this arc from up here and go around here to this 
end angle. Oh yeah, we got that too. And clockwise, are we going clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, this is clearly counterclockwise arc. Well, we'll say false on our clockwise. On clockwise, by the way, maybe we want to make this configurable so that other people using our pi, because we might reuse this pi in other code besides right here, they might want to specify that they want to go clockwise. So let's create a little var up here clockwise, which is a bool, and I'll have it default to being counterclockwise. We'll use it down here clockwise. This is just a nice mechanism for letting people configure this if they want, but I'm providing a little default, so that's fine. While I'm up here, let me talk a little bit about these vars because some of you might be saying, ah, these should be lets. We don't change them or anything like that, so they should be lets. But that is not true in this particular case. All of these need to be vars for a little bit different reasons. These two need to be vars because we're going to animate these. They are going to be animated. Shapes can be animated, unlike views. Views cannot be animated, but shapes can. And so we want these to be vars because they are going to vary when we do the animation. And then this one is also an interesting case. If we made this be a let, then when we initialized it right here, it would get instantly initialized before even the initialization pass here because it's a let and it just got a value. Lets can only ever get a value once because they're constants. So now someone who's creating a pi wouldn't be able to specify the clockwise because we initialized it right out from under them. This is the one case in even in a view, let alone in a shape, where you might want a var. It's a var that you give a default value for, but you still want people who create it to be able to specify it. So you can't put let here. That's a nice little aside about vars and lets there. And the final piece of our arc is we need to come back to the center, drawing a line here. So we already know how to draw lines, p.addLine to our center. And that is it. We got a nice little shape here that we should be able to use to draw the pie that we want. We can go back now to our memory game. And instead of using a circle, put the pie there. Let's make some space, say pie. When we create a pie, notice we got two different ways to create it. One is just the start angle and the end angle, and the other is the start angle, the end angle, and the clockwise. So it's kind of cool that it's showing you, yeah, you don't have to do clockwise if you want. And in fact, we're not going to do clockwise. And how about creating these start angles? Well, angle is just a struct, so we can create it. And when we create an angle, we can create it with degrees or radians. Let's go ahead and do degrees. We want our starting angle here to be straight up. So you might think that straight up is zero degrees. If we had like a compass rose here, this would be zero, 90, 180, 270, 360. So we probably want to start out at zero. And then the end angle here, also in degrees, what's our end angle? Yeah, it's a little more than 90, 100, maybe 100, 110 or 115, something like that. Let's go with 110. So we've just replaced our circle right here with our own shape, our pi, with the start angle and end angle. Let's resume, moment of truth. Uh-oh, this didn't quite work. What is going on right here? This, this is not the same as this. We've definitely got some problems with our uh, angles here or something. It turns out the problem here is that the angle zero, when you're drawing with all the CG stuff and paths, is actually out to the right, not up. So unfortunately, zero is not compass row zero. It's zero, 90, 180, 270, 360 going around right there. So anytime you're specifying an angle, if you want to be thinking compass rows, you need to subtract 90 degrees from any angle that you're using. That should fix our problem, right? Uh, oops, nope, still didn't fix our problem. It is doing the right angles. It's going up and over here, but it's going clockwise instead of counterclockwise. And man, I am sure that we don't specify the clockwise here. I'm certain, yeah, clockwise 
false and clockwise, we definitely say we want counterclockwise. Why are we getting clockwise here? Well, that happens because of a very, very important thing you need to understand when you're doing all this drawing in your shape is that your origin for drawing your, for your coordinate system is not normal Cartesian coordinates here, where this is zero, zero, and increasing Y is going up this way, and increasing X is going over this way. The origin is actually up here. This is zero, zero in the origin, and this is increasing Y, and this is increasing X. So it's actually upside down. You're drawing, in a way, upside down, because you're increasing Y is going down the screen. And that's what causes this clockwise to be backwards because this whole thing is a little bit upside down. So if you have an argument clockwise that you're passing into a pie and you expect the users of it to be thinking in normal right side up kind of coordinate system, then you might want to invert the clockwise to be the opposite. And sure enough, that fixes our problem. So it's a little bit of a tricky thing because programmers know that clockwise is upside down so you might leave it this way and then just have your code call it this with true but it's also kind of nice when you're reading the code to think clockwise false means counterclockwise especially since this is a pie so it's clockwiseness is quite an important piece of the puzzle here so it's a little bit of an art of programming as to whether you want to auto invert the clockwise to be more what we think is clockwise versus what the drawing system says. So victory, we have built exactly what we tried to build here. Pretty simple code here in our card view, which is what we want. Next week, we're going to do the animation. And the animation just involves changing this angle right here. This angle starts up here, and it just starts ticking down, ticking down. This is actually getting to be a larger and larger number because this is 110 degrees. There's 150, 180. In fact, we can see it going here if we type it. Let's go from 100 to 150. It ticks down a little bit. Let's go to 200. Tick down a little bit more. Maybe 300. Ticking down a lot. 340. Time's almost up. 360. Oh, time's up on this one. So we'll learn all about how to do that kind of animation next week, as well as a whole bunch of other kinds of animation. Uh, in the meantime, enjoy your homework, and we'll see you then. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.